and maybe that's not just a, a female founded company, but a minority founded company. Mm-hmm. And the, I'll say like extreme challenges that come with that, like someone not looking me directly in my eyes as a 25 year old woman in the alcohol space. You're listening to The Real You, thoughts, ideas, and perspectives from the ordinary and all of us. My name is Dooley, and this podcast is in partnership with Pocket Change, the social platform built to show the real you. What have you been up to, though? What's sort of your, your taking over your life right now? Or? Oh, gosh. Everything. <laughs> um, I We're just gearing up to launch in Minnesota in the next, like, three weeks. So it's just a lot of, like, legal work, a lot of, like, logistics work, submissions, uh, hiring like just a lot of that and then on top of that like keeping Colorado in a groove and we're the first like kind of few months of January we're a little bit slow as far as events go and we're kind of back on our like multiple events a week and nights and weekends and just so so with that how does how because I'm totally lost to the product world especially when it comes to like alcohol I guess do you want to give kind of a brief what that looks like in your world and how do you even expand with that like on the legal side and getting into stores or bars or I just don't even know what that looks like sure um so once the product is finished we still store everything in cold storage um there's a couple different avenues you can go we started with self-distribution um from there we brought on a distributor last June Um, And so they do a lot of the sales and logistics. And then we also, um, from our team's perspective, go on a lot of sales as well, Mm -hmm. um, kind of as the brand rep. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as far as like what's legally needed, um, formula and label submission through the TTB, Mm -hmm. um, obviously insurance, (laughs) getting a wholesale license, and if you're doing self-distribution, you've got to do that state by state. Yeah. Okay. If you a distributor, they can do it in various different states. So um, we've got a distributor here, but we're doing self-distribution in Minnesota. So uh, we've got to get all of the licenses and everything else for that state. And the laws vary, um, vary a lot state to state. Yeah, yeah. So even with the hard kombucha thing, how did you start with that? Like even getting a recipe, I know people do homemade kombuchas and that can be kind of um, a daunting process but how did you choose that or why and then how did you all of a sudden say wait a sec we should take this one another step further and get a brand behind it and all that sort of stuff yeah so actually the brand came first before the brewing um (laughs) I was working in corporate events I got furloughed from my job when COVID hit um at the same time mayor of denver declared liquor stores non-essential businesses for a brief few hour period um i was furloughed and had some time on my hands so i started researching prohibition um from there found that classic cocktails emerged to mask core flavors of hooch or bad alcohol Mm -hmm. that's kind of the first part of the name the second part i've been drinking kombucha for a while it's got the health benefits my sister was living in San Diego, which is kind of a capital for hard kombucha. There's a lot of hard kombuchas coming out of California. And uh, she would send me some and be like, try these if they come to Denver. And then the second part of the name just kind of slapped me. And I was like, hooch, booch. It makes total sense. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, then I bought a homebrew kit because I was like, I should probably start to figure out how to do this on my own. Mm. And quickly found out that it's best left to the experts and found a brewery um, on South Broadway Mm -hmm. called Dos Luces who helped us with all all of our initial uh, recipes. Okay, awesome. So how did you then take the leap moving forward? So at this point you're off the job stuff, like were you scared financially or did you start getting a team? Did what was the first kind of excitement of it and then biggest fear of it? Um, uh, the first kind of steps were like putting together a a proposal, but I'm more of a visual person. So it was more of like, kind of like a slide deck of what I was imagining. Mm -hmm. Um, so really kind of focusing on the brand, 
which was the exciting part. I think the brewing part was a little bit daunting trying to find a brewer that would help us do it. Um, I mean, financially, the upfront costs weren't, you know, awful Mm -hmm. um, because we were just doing really small batches, like five gallons. And so it was like, all you needed to brew five gallons of tea, one SCOBY, like it was pretty small. Mm -hmm. And because I'd been furloughed from my job, I was on unemployment. So it was like, I was getting paid from unemployment to start to work on hooch pooch related things. And so it was just like a passion project at that point. Um, and then I feel like it started to click and start gaining momentum. And I was like, I'm going to do this like for real, for real. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And that's when like, you know, incorporating a business and, um, and all of those things start to fall in and, and trademarking your business because a name is important and, and things like that too. Yeah. So what then, I guess, even in now the current day, so actually we're just timeline. When was this starting during? COVID 2020 kind of time? Yeah, uh, June of 2020. Okay, so I guess we're you're almost almost two years in at this point then? Yeah. All right, so but what- we launched or, the actual product in May of 2021, so one year later. Okay, so basically on your first year of actually up and going and talking right. to people and getting it out there and all that sort of stuff. So what's been, what's like a moment of I guess, excitement and all that, that you've like, that keeps you kind of waking up and wanting to do it? Um, I mean, there's lots of excitement. I think it's a, a constant roller coaster in entrepreneurship and especially in a CPG world of like super high highs and really low lows. Mm-hmm. Um, the highs being like, someone will find our product and like message us and be like, oh my gosh, this is like so amazing. Or like people will like, it just starts to click or like our TikTok gets a lot of views and we're like, people are actually starting to find out about us. But it's honestly more when I'll like mention it, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm the founder of a hard kombucha company. And they'll be like, oh, which one? And I say hooch booch. And they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of it. And it wasn't like that at the beginning. Like at the beginning, I would have to explain it, explain what was happening. And it's like, it feels like it's starting to catch this like traction and momentum. And that's like the exciting piece is like, oh, more people are hearing about it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So for sure. That's awesome. All right. And then the, the low lows, because I feel very much like that's the uh, also the, the hidden part of the entrepreneurship is, you know, even all uh, everyone coming to kind of put this face of, OK, it's all going great. We're figuring it out. Um, that in itself takes a ton of mental capacity. But when it comes to the low lows, like, have you found practices to kind of deal with that? Is it your team? Is it your your mom helped call on your mom like that's where I go <laughs> but um yeah what's your sort of thought on that because I, I think there's a lot of friends too who have been in the startup game that just it's beaten up left and right yeah and I will say a lot of it happens like behind closed doors and behind the curtain right it's definitely not something we portray I'll say like the hardest part is probably like how isolating the world of entrepreneurship can be and how it really pulls you away from everything else in your life. Um, I feel like, you know, friendships and things have been strained and I've been a little bit disconnected and feeling a little bit like <clears throat> I'm not fully present in every single task at hand because there's so many things that are on my mind. It's like, I can't just like drop in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's probably like the lowest low piece or like finding out you didn't get a deal you wanted or, or things like that. Um, it, it makes you feel like, Oh my gosh, my brand is a total waste and whatever, but that's, that's absolutely not the case. And I think it's, you know, reframing the narrative in our minds of like, just because you get one, no, yeah. but a hundred yeses doesn't yeah. mean your business is bad or a failure. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like leaning on people or things, I would say my dad is definitely my go-to when it comes to like hard decisions or hard things. Um, He mentors other entrepreneurs. And so uh, he's kind of been in that space before, but it's also like family related too. So it's like, yes, sometimes there's tough love, but there's also like a, a really strong backbone of like, Hey, you've got it. Keep going. Like, I'm proud of you. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as far as like how I deal (laughs) with it, um, 
I recently, so I teach yoga as well. Um, I recently started at a new studio called Viv Cycle. And I think the best part about being there is I can go take a cycle class and like work my absolute ass off. And that's when I start to forget about everything else. And it's like someone else is telling me what to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't have to be the end all be all decision maker. Yeah. And that's the best feeling. <laughs> yeah. That's wow. That's awesome. I've totally kind of, you know, relate on the, the yoga aspect too. Um, so beyond even my own physical, I have like hip issues and all that. There was a day, the, um, I guess it was a couple weeks ago when same thing, just that overwhelmed feeling of, oh shit, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I wake up and I'm confused and this sort of stuff. And you kind of just start to get in your own head, tell yourself stories about what other people are thinking about it, all these things. Um, and I literally went one day and I was kind of exhausted, had a little bit of stomach ache, but I went in to, to do one of the hot yoga things. And I talked to the, uh, person before I was like hey look I'm not even feeling that good today I'm just kind of here to step out and I actually did the class where I didn't even like follow the thing I essentially just like lied there and like did my whatever down dog and like the very basic things um but ended up coming out of that situation and I had like three people from the class come up to me and be like wow like you're an inspiration all this stuff and I like what and it was literally just because I didn't do anything in the yoga class <laughs> and it was like a funny moment to me because I think why the people came up to me about me literally there's a full class everyone doing all the stuff I'm just sitting there in the corner was they were feeling my like clear need for just mm-hmm. entering into a separate space a separate mind like a separate um leap in my day and coming out of it like I did feel refreshed it was really just the separation of the like constant yelling of your own head into your mind from coming into another space so um I I just totally connect with you on that round yeah and something on that too like it has me thinking a lot about how like yoga back in the day was very like sedentary and seated because we were nomads and we were traveling around and so our practice was sitting in stillness Mm. and you know, yoga as we know it today, the asana, the flow, the movement Mm -hmm. came about because we were sitting a lot at our desks, right? And we needed that movement. And now I feel like it's almost reverting back to this, like, we constantly live in a life of go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And to your point of just like, what if you just sit in the corner and take it all in? Yeah. And that's kind of where like meditation goes. And I think especially as an entrepreneur, like, yeah, sometimes there are the days when I'm like, I just need to cycle and like work my absolute ass off and like have someone scream in my face. And then there's other days when my day is so go, go, go that like, if I can carve out 20 minutes to sit in complete silence, that's like the thing that's needed most. Yeah. 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 The hardest thing for me. Yeah. I was someone, I wish I could actually show a little thing of it yesterday. Um, someone in the pocket change app, the question was like, what's a biggest challenge for you or something like that. And I responded and there's kind of some things of people working on stuff but my answer was literally to like sit with myself like whether it be the meditation thing even reading like I found um, I'm not read the dune books but I've gotten kind of into that and I still find myself making up excuses to take 15 minutes to read even if it's five pages or whatever just how hard it is to actually sit there and just be comfortable with not doing something like, it feels like I'm wasting time. I'm not, I'm already behind. I'm already low on money. I'm already all these different things to the point of, you know, I, like, but in reality, to find those kind of moments of stillness is also where I think like, inspiration can come from or also shifting, like, putting a, um, almost like a roadblock in your habit to the point of now it creates space to think of a new way to do that, whether it be on the business stuff, a new way to, approach a sales thing or location or idea or how to talk to a team member about a problem you're having like um yeah I don't know I just think that it's become one of the most difficult yet powerful practices of just literally six minutes of sitting with your eyes closed in a chair or even walking outside without a phone like how much that can actually do yeah and also fascinating on how many people don't do that or like how 
how easy it is, like you were saying, for it to fall to the wayside. Like one of my yoga teachers was saying, like, when you have time, meditate for 20 minutes. When you don't have time, meditate for 30. Yeah. <laughs> it, like shows how powerful um sitting still really is. Like if you can just carve out a certain amount of time in your morning and like I, I need to take my own advice too, because normally I'm like yeah. jump and go. Um but just really allowing like some time for your like mind and body to get settled before stepping into the day. I feel like I can be so much more productive when I tune in like that right away. But yeah, I was my alarm 20 minutes earlier. <laughs> yeah. So I also have a, uh, it's kind of like life coach therapist person that I talk with. Um, and I was talking, I'm actually talking to him later today, but um, like on this, in this sort of context, but I was talking to him about this idea and his experience because his job is essentially working and talking with people about very intimate vulnerable parts of their lives and um, a lot of times people going through stuff all that and he was saying that one of the most interesting things is people will cancel on him in the times that his per like his purpose is to be a spot to take space and talk through things or just whatever you need but um yeah, we, we had that kind of conversation too about it's in the times of your kind of overly momentum when it doesn't make sense to slow down is when it's like the check on yourself to take in. Maybe it is just calling a friend for 20 minutes to catch up, whatever it is, but again, just pulling yourself out of that. Um, so I think that's also one of those practices of my, I mean, hopefully forever in life, but this year, especially when I'm recognizing my self-awareness around getting caught up in my own stories I create and then doing little practices to separate myself from those. Yeah, absolutely. I feel you on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. So with the kind of next steps around uh, hooch booch and everything, um, you had talked about your guys' interest in starting to be more kind of cause aligned in, in certain areas. And you talked a lot about um, the gender equity stuff. What, like, why gender equity and why being a startup tight on money, all these different things, put all that extra effort in. I just want to like hear your thought process around. Yeah. Um, so I think my initial thought process around giving at all, again, as a startup tight on money, um, it's not about what comes back to us or what benefit it offers to to us and, and i think when when we start to look at what's important i think one of the most important things for me being a female founder is talking to other like-minded individuals and, and maybe that's not just a, a female founded company but a minority founded company mm -hmm. and the I'll say like extreme challenges that come with that, like someone not looking me directly in my eyes as a 25 year old woman in the alcohol space. Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, there's been countless times where I've felt quite disadvantaged being a woman in the space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think specifically a young woman. Mm -hmm. um, I think any sort of young entrepreneur maybe gets a second take, but e even more so female. And so I think kind of backing up a little bit when we were trying to figure out where the best place to start, even donating a small amount, like what is, what's going to be our greatest reach and how can we start to have a conversation around it versus it just being like a, well, this is just a write-off and it's something that we can put on our website to be like, here's the good that we do. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of spun from me kind of poking around to other um, competitors, other people in the beverage space, just other people in general looking at their websites. What are other people doing, you know, in the industry? And it, it felt like to me, a lot of people, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but, you know, it was like, I think it's a lot of people in the kombucha space are like 1% for the planet, which is amazing. And I think that's, that's great. And I also think like, what conversations are we having around it? Like what's happening again, like behind the closed curtain mm -hmm. that we're doing to also better the planet or better mm -hmm. female empowerment, things like that. And so that's why we came to you all at Pocket Change to be like, yes, this is important. We feel like we want to donate and, and give back, but how do we do it intentionally? Mm -hmm. um, 
in a way that feels both supportive for us and the organization because I feel like us as such a small business donating to 1% for the planet a 1% of our sales right now are so insignificant and not insignificant, but quite small. Mm. Um, and so where can we make an impact on a larger level? And I think that's not just the donation piece, but the conversation around it. Yeah. Yeah. What? So yeah, I think that's <laughs> totally on point with, you know, you start to see all these big headlines of like billionaires just giving a ton of money, to these different things. But in reality, the shift of whether it be, for the actual cause themselves or just the way that our culture and humans interact with each other, I think does start from conversation, communication, the way we start to show like what our values are and actually acting on them. And not again, not just in a charitable sense, but in day to day on how we treat other people. Um, what sort of goals, I guess, would you have, you know, being a female founder in the entrepreneurship space beyond your brand and the hooch booch and all that, but I guess, what do you want to see more of in terms of woman empowerment and gender equity in the startup world? Like, do you have any sort of thought around what that could be? Like, for example, I've seen um, some investment firms and stuff like that, that has been a lot more focused on doing uh, woman led teams and stuff like that. Like, is that kind of a direction you see as positive or what are the little things, I guess, that you'd want to kind of start to see happening over the years? through your own journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so many things and I think it starts um, at the core of the way that we're being raised. I think it starts young and like, what figures do we have in our lives that allow for female empowerment? And what conversations are we having with youth you know, um, and not just women to empower them, but also males or other identifying individuals to raise up minority groups first and foremost. Um, and then I think is on like an entrepreneurship level, um, it's a it's quite a significant amount less. I don't know the actual numbers of female to male startups or founders. Um, and so like, how can we start to raise those numbers and, and what does it take? Like, and I think it's a lot of mentorship. I think it's like us having these conversations and hopefully someone sees it and it's like, Hey, Anna, I think what you're doing is amazing. Like, I would love to talk to you about starting my own business. And I, I think it starts at this very like seed level of like individuals and individuals. Like I was on a panel of a couple of weeks back and it was just like a female entrepreneurship panel and it was primarily females that showed up to the event and they were like I've got this idea I've got this idea but like where do I take the next step mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the more difficult pieces too is like finding funding for women is more difficult than men as well mm -hmm. and so how do we break down these barriers to make it easier for women or you know let's talk about a female or a female identifying body having a child and like, what does that look like in their workplace and how do they get the time that they need to support their business too? Yeah. So yeah. I think there's also gender equity within larger organizations too, um, mm -hmm. not just startups, but I think it really does start at like a young age of having conversations around like women can have any job that a man can, a woman can have any job that a man can have. And as a woman, I can, be more successful, whatever that means, um, than my counterpart or have a higher titled job doesn't make anyone a better person at the end of the day. Um, but there's that too.